Good afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. Many of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action center on education. To move forward, we need to take the past and to teach it accurately in the present. We need to indigenize, some people say, what we're teaching our children in public schools across the country. And we need to rethink what a colonial education system is teaching indigenous kids. Today, we're putting all of that in focus, and we want you to join our conversation about what we're teaching our kids. Uh, what's your school doing, or what are they not doing? Our phone lines are open, so give us a call toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in Focus. Before I introduce you to our guests, let's take a look at some of the stories APTN has covered where education takes an Indigenous turn. Here's Willow Fiddler with students at Kijik Bay who are learning fractions by chopping wood. Bonjour! Right on. Now what does a wing do? You won't likely find pen and paper in this classroom. It's the Elter Education Program at Mwani Natawagang Memorial School in Kijik Bay, where students as young as four are taking their learning outdoors. We're trying to uh, find an alternative education program using traditional uh, and uh, cultural methods uh, that fit kids uh, today that because sometimes the kids that may not do great in the classroom do exceptionally well outside with the hunting and the fishing and the, the carving and, and that. So it's a balance point. Which For three years, students from kindergarten to grade eight have been learning how to tap birch trees for syrup and make spears to catch fish. Things that Kendall says the community hasn't done for decades. Kind of uh, making everything old new again. The school secretary says the program keeps kids from getting bored or in trouble. For me, when I was growing up, I didn't have, I didn't know anything about culture in the school system. Like, there was nothing there. Like, I didn't know any of this until Mark came to the school here and I started to learn different things about my culture and, and so did the children. Ningawans' children went through the program. Her three-year-old granddaughter even participates when she can. When they're here plucking a goose, she's right there plucking a goose along with all the other kids. Teachers are now finding ways of delivering their curriculum using the outdoors. We are teaching curriculum outside. For instance, the kids that build the wigwam, they've written about it, they've researched it on the internet, they come out, they build it with their own hands. Then they take that experience, put it on paper uh, in a book form. The students involved in every step. Get in the spots that are. Go get in the spots that are bended up so they have to pour it on there. I really like. I like helping out because I think this is fun and we get to do more creativity and outdoor ed. And it's mostly one of my favorite classes in the school year so far. Kendall says students feel a sense of ownership and pride when they help build something. It's a, it's a way that they can see their success very quickly. Whereas, say, sitting in a classroom, writing some tests, waiting for that report card to see if you've got success, for some kids doesn't really work. But the kids that come out and they build a wigwam, well, we built a wigwam, and there's our success. And that success is having other positive impacts as well. Kids are so engaged with the outdoor program, and the teachers are taking the outdoor experience into the classroom that in some cases we've, uh, we've increased attendance 35% with some uh, students and up to 20% up to in some grades. It's been a great thing for, for kids that can't sit in their class and it, maybe it's not the way they learn. And we're finding that some of those kids, they learn equally as well, if not better, outside. And they're finding success too now. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. So in Northwest Territories, kids are also learning outside of the classroom. Charlotte Moret Jacobs takes us to Bush School, where the parents are also there to learn and to teach. These kids can be trusted with knives. They know what they are doing. They are making bougon, dry meat. To the bottom, see how it's still thick, you can see. The classroom is the land for Deshinta Bush University. Parents earn university credits with UBC, U of A, and McGill by studying textbook work and practical skills at Deshinta. The bonus? They get to bring their kids for the entire semester. I was rushing, 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 and my arms were still tired from yesterday. 
the kids are put to work completing their regular school work on top of land-based activities. What are you going to use that for, Dominic? Something Cheryl Mandeville, mother of Dominic, is happy about. When I told his teacher what we were doing and that we would be away for the month, he's like, awesome. He could learn way more out there than, you know, he can in here, so. The kids are learning the same skills and completing the same tasks as the adults. They are gathering supplies to hang their dry meat. I can trust him to make his own fire. He's, he's very happy about that. He's like, Mom, I could make my own fire now. And he knows, you know, we don't play with matches or lighters at home. It's something, it's, it's a survival skill. Deshinta has been around for almost 10 years. Kids U instructors like Justina Black are alumni of the program and understand the need for parents to be present. For uh, Indigenous people, we have uh, children with us in our communities a lot, and I think that's really important in keeping a balance of the relationships that we maintain in community and having the different energies within the camp as well. Black says her job is to help the children connect with the land and to themselves. And it's not just the kids who benefit. As a Dene person, that is our way. We continue passing on the teachings, and uh, it is a part of our lifestyle, so I think it's important that I continue passing on what I can with these kids. A few days ago, the camp shot a moose. Mandeville said the kids stayed up to help without complaint. And it's being part of all of the different little processes, so it's... He's being involved is the most important thing, right? The last task of the day is journaling. Something to show the parents, but more importantly, to show the kids how much they've learned. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, ABT on National News, Mackenzie Island, near Detta. Joining me now in studio is Myra Lamary, L Laramie, sorry. She's the elder and knowledge keeper for the Winnipeg School Division. She spent 35 years in education as a teacher, a counselor, administrator. She researched and wrote Teaching and Learning as an Act of Love, the, an examination of the impact of seven uh, traditional Indigenous teaching practices in teacher education and teachers' classroom practices. She was also at Nijimakwa School here in Winnipeg. Thank you for joining me. Oh, you're quite welcome. So it's, I want to hear, so 35 years. A little bit's changed in education since when you got in. Take us back to what it was, I mean, so you're an Indigenous teacher 35 years ago. It's probably more like closer to 50 years ago uh, when I started. I started in 1976. Jeez. And when I joined the Winnipeg School Division, uh, there was a couple of us that started a call out to other teachers, Indigenous teachers, and there we ended up with nine of us. That's, I mean, that's incredible. In the whole school division, yeah. In the whole school division, yeah. and the Winnipeg School Division is yeah. the largest in, in Winnipeg. Yeah. Seven. And so I think that those were the out indigenous people because there were some um, teachers that we talked to that didn't want to have anything to do with um, classifying themselves as indigenous. They just wanted to be teachers to be yeah. to do their craft, to do the work. And so some of those folks said no, th no thanks because we wanted to start a, a, a support group mm -hmm. for us at the time and. Um, I don't know what the figures are now, but I, I know that I personally work in a team of uh, about 20 Indigenous young people who are teachers, certified teachers. That That's just the team yeah. that I work with. And I, I don't know what the what the numbers are in... in I don't live by numbers. Yeah. I live by people and the kids and the youth. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's been growth. Um, has there been enough? I don't know if we'll ever get to that. Yeah. But what matters is that we get up in the morning and keep trying our best to show all the students we work with what it means to have a good life. 
What did we, before we got started, we were talking about, you know, there's lots of people talk about we need to indigenize the classroom. <laughs> and you, you said, I got to tell you something. <laughs> Share with our audience what you had to, and it makes perfect sense. Well, the way I was taught about who I am is I am indigenous. Um, Nahayo. I'm Cree. But I'm also Ojibwe. I didn't. Anyway, um, my parents taught me that you can't, you can't indigenize something. Yeah. It is or it isn't. You're, you're an indigenous person or you're not. Mm -hmm. And to indigenize, when they say indigenize education, that's one more time that they're trying to make something that we are into a system that isn't mm -hmm. indigenous. Right. So we didn't have education. But there's, we, there's so much uh, focus and effort on, so many people are trying to do this. They, they, they have you because they, they want to, um, I don't know if it's they want to teach indigenous history better or they want it to seem more inclusive. Like what are, they, what's, what are they trying to do? If you can't indigenize education, what is it that they're trying to do? I think what, what people are, at least the ones that have stepped forward to, to risk learning, mm -hmm. are trying to take what we've always had as Indigenous people and show others what that looks like, what that sounds like, what that feels like. Mm -hmm. um, an example is, is uh, you know, taking, taking young people to, to sweat lodges that mm -hmm. they've never been, been before. Um, and, and not just indigenous kids, taking right. all kids who want to go and want to learn about that. Um, I know that in our school division, indigenous learning is for everyone. It's not just for indigenous kids. What's the benefit of that? Well, the bene for me the benefit is that they'll get to know the similarities that their cultures have. Um, I teach a university course on Saturday morning and it's, it's, it's kids who've come from these systems, right, into mm -hmm. university. And it's a very diverse population of young folks and take them to a sweat lodge or have a little boy, little boy water drum ceremony with them. They come to me afterwards and say, Myra, we have some of that kind of thing in our, in our culture, in our ways. Not the same, mm -hmm. but it's similar. And I, my parents always taught me to try and help people understand we're more the same than we're different. Yeah. And yes, we have differences and they need to be respected and they need to be honored. Um, my mom taught me, the first time I ever heard the word ally was from my mom. And she, she told me that, that an ally is someone who can walk with you, who doesn't want to be Indian who doesn't want to stand in our own skin or have their own sweat lodge, they're okay with being Ukrainian, with being yeah. whatever, right? And she said, that's an ally. Mm -hmm. And so I was raised to work with all people. And because I asked my daddy one time, I said, why, why, don't, why don't I just work with my own people, dad? And he said, because you weren't made that way. And so... That's interesting. So he knew. Yeah. You know, was that a wake-up yeah. call to you as well that it made you have that realization that you, you, your, your path was to what? My first spirit name, public name, is Neil Gabwick. And the way grandmother taught me about that was that I'm the woman that sits at the center for directions. Mm. And in my work, I can never, ever turn anyone away from the knowledge that I carry. I don't have my language. And I don't lament about that anymore because one of, the, one of the pieces for me is protecting it. We have language programs in Winnipeg School Division and we started them off real slow. My granddaughters in, in the Cree program and it's, it's an arduous time to find teachers who can teach by experience 
because that's the way language was learned. You, you didn't get up and go to a square room in the morning. Mm -hmm. You woke up and went out with your nugam and, and, and your musham and you learned about the things that were around you. Mm -hmm. So we try as hard as it is in, a, in an urban setting to have our, our language program experiential mm -hmm. and take them, taking them out on the land. Um, I don't say land-based education because Mother Earth is not land-based education. Mm -hmm. Learning about our relationship with her is about learning about Minapumatsyan. And when we do that, we show kids the life that we had prior to contact. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is when you do that, sometimes you have a result that you weren't bargaining for. And I took a group of high school kids out to Birds Hill Park mm -hmm. to look for some sage. Everybody's into doing smudging. And that's a good thing. But where we sat down, the, the field next to us was blank. No sage. Gone. Mm -hmm. So the best I could do with them that day was to have them put their hands on the earth. And I asked them to feel her. I asked them to know her energy because when you're graduated and in society, you are the ones that are going to be taking over. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you don't know her, we're all going to be in trouble. Yeah. And this is kids, these are indigenous kids, not indigenous. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Did the, and did you see that that resonates with the group? Did it resonate more with Indigenous students than non-Indigenous students? It, it, I think it res. I don't. I don't use the word resonate. It touched their heart. Mm. It touched their. It touched here. And when they got up, I said, "There's tobacco bowl there. A tobacco bowl there." I said, "I would like you, if you so choose." to take some tabasema in your left hand and go where that field is blank okay. and talk to Mother Earth that maybe somehow it can come back, that sage. And they left there with no sage. They, they, didn't, they didn't pick because what was there was almost gone. That's heartbreaking. We have a caller who wants to talk. We have Stephen, who's calling in from Winnipeg here. How are you, Stephen? I'm doing just fine. Good. What can we do for you today? You got a comment, I'd, a question? Yes, I'd like to say uh, Tonsay to that beautiful woman you have there. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, with what you're speaking to do with uh, Indigenous uh, spirituality, uh, my good friend and mentor from Norway House Cree Nation, his name was Nathaniel Kweska Capo, and he taught me that an indigenous person first has to be indigenous. Uh, and what he means by that is, even going forward to believe in religions that were imposed on uh, indigenous people, mm -hmm. you first have to be who you are before you can be anything else. And I, I find the solutions going way back to the beginning you know, uh, to listen to the teachings of shamans and uh, elders. To get back to a basic, simple time, we are all spiritual people. And I, I, I wish and hope that uh, since religion is not recognized in schools, that uh, we could take indigenous spirituality as a guide for every student in Canada. How do you think it would benefit non-Indigenous students? You've, it seems that, sounds like you've put a lot of thought into this. I'm curious how you think this would, would be beneficial to everybody. Because our spirits are all the same. Mm -hmm. yes. Our kindness, our goodness, our love, and our sharing are all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all been separated by religion. Yeah. When, uh, when I first went to Norway House, I was asking elders, you know, what happened here? And uh, they starved half the people fed the other half, experimented on them, uh, gave religious people jobs, uh, made a, a lower class in, 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 and divided people. And uh, that, you know, still goes on uh, 
to some degree today. Mm-hmm. And that, in my opinion, is the biggest uh, thing that is keeping Indigenous people apart and from moving forward together. I'm thankful that you took time to give us a call, Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, We're going to take a break in a little bit, but before we go, I want to... Um, share a, a Cree version of O Canada with you all. From It's courtesy of Grosvenor School here in Winnipeg. Uh, it's a inner city school, uh, well, fairly inner city, I guess, uh, Grosvenor. Not a lot of Indigenous students go there, but they play uh, O Canada in French and English and also in Cree. I want to share it with you guys. <laughs> Now, you can call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. We asked, does your child learn enough about Indigenous uh, culture and history in schools? Andrika says, yes, my children attend a Wagalus school in our community. It provides a wonderful cultural program with singing, dancing, learning, the language, and more. That's wonderful. We hear from George does not learn enough about anything in school. Most of the people who knew things were killed over 500 years ago. Everything is just a shadow of itself. We've got Sarah. Uh, What always bothered me is not learning the history correctly and that uh, only those schools near indigenous communities learn about them. All should know the horrors. And we have Jason. They lie about their part in our genocide and omit education about the effects of racism and all, all our social and economic structures. It's almost a sham education, I'd say. And from Judy, it's about a child learning enough about indigenous culture in school, or is that children needing to, or need to learn in traditional circle, in traditional ways, and the curriculum needs to fit those traditional ways? That's what you were saying before the break, Myra. Um, and Darian. Indigenous youth and non-Indigenous are not being taught the right information about Canada's inhumane history towards First Nations in Canada. That's, thanks very much for everybody who took time to uh, write in for that. We also, uh, we had a poll this week. On Facebook we asked, let's, I'm not sure if we have the question here. Uh, we asked, does your child learn enough about Indigenous culture and history in school? 11% of you said yes, but 89% said no. If you would like to add your opinion to our topic of conversation, here's how you can do that. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. We are going to go now to the Nipissing First Nation in Ontario where there's a whole lot more going on than reading, writing, and arithmetic. Monday to Friday at 8.50 every school day, beats like this resonate throughout the halls of Nabizing Secondary School. Culture and language isn't just read about in library books. At this school, it's a living learning experience. Good morning, staff and students of Nabizing Secondary School. That's one reason 16-year-old Brooklyn Sawyer decided to transfer here last year. 
There's a lot of cultural courses like drumming, indigenous studies, and like um, Aboriginal beliefs. And there's Ojibwe here. There's the Ojibwe here is more intense than the other school I went to, and I'm personally studying the language because I'm hoping to become like a language teacher when I'm older. The school has been in operation since 1995. According to Principal Carol Colliard, culture, language, and community are entwined. That's what's so unique about it. It's all the students called by our first name. Um, they don't call me Miss Coolyard. A lot of them aren't even sure what my last name is. <laughs> but I'm Carol, and all the teachers, we view ourselves as guides. We're here to guide them at this point in their journey. We're not the only guides. We connect with community partners. We connect with the elders, with the knowledge keepers, and they, as a team, we teach and guide these students. Nipissing First Nation is one of 23 Anishinaabek communities that signed on to the Anishinaabek Education Agreement. According to lead negotiator Tracy O'Donnell, it's taken 20 years to get to this point. As of last April, the participating First Nations have taken full control over education for junior kindergarten to grade 12. Right now the communities are in the process of transition. They're working from moving out from the federal system of providing education programs and services into the Anishinaabek education system. So there's some transitions that are going on right now. We're establishing our student information management system and working with the communities to identify their educational needs and priorities so that we can work in plans to address those. As the Deputy Chief of Nipissing First Nation and an ex-teacher from this school, Muriel Sawyer says they're ready. We're well on our way, but we hope to uh, advance even more so uh, in terms of immersion programming and, and different types of programming that, we, that will give us the autonomy, that, the autonomy that we now have to do so. Blair Bocage is a language and culture teacher. He agrees immersion programming is needed. He says the Ojibwe language is at a critical point for survival. Right now he's pleased to see the signs of transition in the school. We're not getting a no anymore for when we try to bring our culture and language. It's, yep, let's do it. How could we make it fit into our school instead of how could we make it fit into the curriculum? According to Deputy Chief Sawyer, the graduation rates in this school are high because the language and culture programs help to instill pride and confidence. She says that's why a First Nations education system is so important. And at Francis APK National News, Nipissing First Nation. I love that story. Uh, I want to talk about the poll results with our guests here. If you're just joining our, discuss our discussion, we're talking about public education, what schools are doing right, and what more could be done to uh, indigenize curriculum. Joining me in studio now is Mary Kersey, and she's the elder in residence for the Seven Oaks School Division here in Winnipeg. And Myra Laramie is the elder and knowledge keeper for the Winnipeg School Division also here in Winnipeg. And we have uh, Kevin Kakagamek from Thunder, joining us from Thunder Bay. He's on the phone here. Uh, he's the Indigenous Outreach Coordinator for the Catholic School Board there. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, it's great to, it's great to connect with you. So I want to ask everybody, so, you know, uh, something that people are saying now is that we're, we're learning more indigenous cult, about Indigenous culture and history than ever before in our public schools. And then you have a poll result that says, 89% of uh, respondents believe that we're not learning enough. What, mm -hmm. I mean, if this is, the, if this is as best as, as, as good as it's ever been, and it's still not good enough, what, what do we do to fix it? I'll start, Kevin, well, you're on the phone, we'll start with you, go first. <laughs> okay, um, I, um, I had years of experience of uh, working for uh, um, a uh, First Nation organization that had a federally run school. Mm -hmm. And I was there as a teacher, and and also I was part of the administration team running a proposal-based program that focused on uh, student achievement. And um, but uh, last beginning of last school year, I was um, I, um, I I took on the role uh, on a new job with the Thunder Bay Catholic District School Board, and um, as the Indigenous Outreach uh, Coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, being a new in the position, um, uh, I kind of sense uh, coming out from uh, First Nation um, surrounding um, that that was kind of the, uh, the, the reality that I faced too in, mm -hmm. in my new, new role. And, um, but one of the things that I did with uh, uh, a year ago at the time, there was also an Aboriginal um, teacher that was also new. 
uh, we collaborated together and we found out uh, we need to do some outreach effort and start connecting with uh, mm -hmm. some of the First Nation communities uh, in our district and also to uh, uh, start connecting and uh, reaching out to some Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers uh, within the, the community. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the main theme of what we focused on was um, uh, how to connect and engage with our Indigenous students uh, in our in our schools mm -hmm. but also to uh to come up with uh, an, a way too of bringing in a program of also how we can create uh cultural awareness uh to the non-indigenous students I, so I think when it's, we, it's good that that school boards school divisions around the country are, are even having this conversation now this that's new right uh, mary yeah. what uh you've been an educator in in education for how many years uh, well i my first, uh, I started in 1974, so just a little bit before <laughs> Myra. And uh, I started out as a, uh, in a multi-classroom, multi-age multi, multi -age and mm -hmm. multi-grade classroom. Here in Winnipeg? Um, it was near Winnipeg, mm -hmm. uh, but it was in a uh, First Nations uh, community, but it was run by um, a school division that was you know, adjacent to, right. the, uh, yeah. uh, to the community. So that's where I started. And I remember my very first day in school. And my principal, who was in, um, in the community, not in our community, but in the community where, where the school division was, and he came and told me, don't worry, Mary, we're, you'll, you're going to get a lot of help. I'll send my resource teacher will be with you for the first month mm -hmm. and uh, you know show you the ropes etc cetera, etc cetera. fine so um, the um, the resource teacher uh, arrived the next day and she brings a big box of uh, um, a big box and she says we are going to you're going to do this this new program called Distar it was a reading program and it was meant for um, students who didn't have sort of the background and and um, it was I looked at it and I thought well you know what am I going to do with this <laughs> um, but anyway and she says and I'll be here every day to assist you and she says and uh, please don't worry I know you come from a a disadvantaged background. Oh my goodness. Went like that. And I said, what? And she says, yeah, you come from a disadvantaged background and disadvantaged culture. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, well, I don't feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, I think I have some gifts to share. And uh, wow, I was, you know, a, and that was my first day yeah. and uh, so she left and she says I'll I'll come back and and help you get started so the next day I went right to the the town where where I uh, the principal was and I said look I don't want her so anyhow she did she didn't she didn't uh, come back and so I was kind of on my own. Right. And I thought, oh, there's lots of things I could do. The first thing, and I was teaching uh, kindergarten, oh. grade one, grade two, grade three, <laughs> all in one classroom. And you're still here to tell about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I decided to visit the parents, the grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I visited each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And I got to know them. And I found out that the community had lost its language. Yeah. There were only maybe two or three elders that spoke the language. Wow. And I'm fluent in, in my language, and, um, which is Anishinaabe Mwen. And uh, so I, uh, I, you know, I decided I was going to teach the language. I mean, that was not in the provincial well, curriculum, <laughs> now was it? Absolutely not. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and this was in 1974. Yeah. So I taught, I taught it, and in my own way. So 
um, I didn't get the privilege of having my principal come in. You know, uh, I was just kind of left on my own. Ring and I totally enjoyed it. Mm. I enjoyed the two years that I spent there. Wow. I, I love that. So when you, I'll ask both of you ladies, so when you see the, the poll results like that, you know, that there's not enough Indigenous culture and, and history taught in our public schools. You guys have spent your, your, your careers in public schools and you know f firsthand that this is as good as it's ever been, right? Is it disappointing when you hear people say it's not enough? What else would you think could be done? Well, it is, it is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm elder in residence for Seven Oaks uh, School Division, and mm -hmm. this is my 10th year. Yeah. There, I, uh, when wow. I retired um, over 10 years ago, I, you know, I had lots of energy to, <laughs> to, to pursue, uh, and I felt that I had the knowledge and I felt that I had the lived experience having been raised in, in residential school. Mm -hmm. I spent two, uh, 10 years in residential school living uh, side by side with uh, my, uh, in my parents, with my parents, but I, nev I could never see them because mm -hmm. that was the law back then. Um, so, and then I spent another two years in, uh, you know, getting a high school because there was no, there was no high school uh, in my community at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but anyway, so we, you know, there is, we've come a long way. And there's still room to grow. There's lots of room to grow. I've and I feel that, you know, uh, we're just, we're making inroads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And back when I was going to university back in the 70s, uh, I had the, uh, the privilege of, me of meeting Chief Dan George. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those of us have, that are a certain age are, remember him well. Mm -hmm. Others, younger people, pro probably We've heard not as <laughs> you've heard of him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and he came to spend time with us while I was going to university in Brandon uh, and uh, so we spent a lot of time with him and uh, uh, and it was 1972 um, we uh, we received a lot of teachings from him and what he said back then is true to Today? this day yeah. so I just wanted yeah. to quote him and yes, I brought I'd his like book this. yeah he says it is difficult for me to understand the deep hate that exists among people. It is hard to understand a culture that justifies the killing of millions in past wars and is at this very moment preparing bombs to kill even greater numbers. It is hard for me to understand a culture that spends more on wars and weapons to kill than it does on education to help and develop. It is hard for me to understand a culture that not only hates and fights his brothers, but even attacks nature and abuses her. And he spent time talking about that particular, um, you know, the hates and the, the uh, fighting nature and, mm -hmm. you know, um, I see my white brothers going about blotting out nature from its cities. Mm -hmm. I see him strip the malls bare, leaving ugly wounds on the, on the face of the mountains. I see him tearing things from the bosom of Mother Earth, as though she were a monster who refused to share her treasures with him. I see him throw poison in the waters, indifferent to the life he kills there, and he chokes the air with deadly fumes. So we're in that era right. at this point in time. And it is up to us, up to the younger generation, to take up the fight and to say that Mother Earth, as Myra explained, Mother Earth is where we get all our yeah all our life. Mm -hmm. And she spoke about Minobima this year. And well, that's, that's, what she, that's what she's there for. 
yeah. that minnow mm -hmm. and that's what we strive for. So if we were to uh, understand a mutual understanding of, of, of that, I think we'd go faster mm -hmm. and a longer way to go. Yeah. But we're, we're getting there. I see, I feel hope when I see, you know, uh, classrooms all across the country, schools all across the country, including, uh, you know, our, including everything in, mm -hmm. in our education process, mm -hmm. because that's what it's all about. Like Myra said, we don't spend within four walls. We don't. Mm -hmm. Our, our yeah. education was based on everything yeah. in our environment. We're so have we to have to break. do that. We're going to go for, to a break, but I don't, I, I like this conversation. I like where this is going. Uh, but we're going to continue this, this discussion, of course, when we come back. Just stay with us. We'll be back in a flash. <laughs> Welcome back. Earlier this year, a homework assignment was brought home by a high school student in St. Paul, Alberta. It included a multiple choice question. Uh, what was a positive effect of residential schools? Uh, that was the question. And children and your options were children were away from home, children learned to read, children were taught manners, children or children became civilized. You get to pick. Now that was, this is, you know, this school year, this is 2018. The school said that the module is outdated and shouldn't have even been distributed. They were, un they were unsure how it was handed out. It's unclear how long this question had even been part of a social module. So today, I think uh, my guests for joining us, we're talking about education. Um, you know, what's being done? What's being, what are we teaching our kids? Are they learning enough about indigenous cultures, um, indigenous history? Um, and I've got some guests who know far better than me. So I guess the question is, you know, we had heard the poll results saying 89% of people who responded to our poll don't feel that there's enough being taught. This is the most that's ever been taught. What can we do? What should we be doing to, what should school divisions be doing to fix this? I don't think it's a matter of only school divisions because a lot of, a lot of, um, the importance of education is placed in the systems, but it's universities, like where are our teachers? Where are our indigenous teachers? Where are our teachers of language? Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm, we're in a time when things like this are going to explode, like programs are going to start, and, and I have the same hope that Mary does. Um, my, my mother never gave up, never gave up. And um, I think that we've been, all of Canada, all Canadians have been kept from the real knowledge of who Indigenous people are and what really happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think in 2018, things are standing out that wouldn't even have come forward before. Yeah. And so we're able to understand that there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But that, that does not obliterate the people who are working really hard at doing things with, um, with education and learning. I remember um, being part of Youth Opportunities Unlimited when I was a kid. And um, we had Menno Weeb come in and create a choir. Mm -hmm. And um, he had enough in his being to understand that was the first time Tom Jackson sang the Huron Carol. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Tom Jackson we was going to be, was on our face-to-face uh, -face last night. We went all around Winnipeg with Menno. But more than that, my parents found money for us. We had a youth corps at the Winnipeg Native Club. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, which elders do you want to bring? And we brought elders from Alberta, Saskatchewan, mm. Ontario. The, we brought Tommy Porter from the Mohawk, Albert Lightning, Ernest Atusis, Philip Deere from South. We brought all kinds. 
and we sat with them. Like, like Mary said when, when uh, Chief Dan George came, and we just listened. We didn't mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. We just listened. We didn't put them in separate rooms like they do now at conferences. Yeah. They put them all together, and they just talked off of one another. And you know what's really interesting about that, my dear? Mm -hmm. Most of those young people who were sitting on that floor in the Native Club listening to these old people mm -hmm. are doing what they're doing. What, what they did for us. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. out there doing ceremony, doing teachings, doing teaching university courses, just just being around like yeah. the old people that came here. Yeah. And to to us, modeling is is everything. Like you try and model what that good life is. And so we may not be very far, but it took 500 years for John A. Macdonald to almost killed the Indian and the child, yeah. but he wasn't successful. No. Kevin, and you're still there? Are you with us, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Kev Kevin's here. here. Now we have him on Skype. Kevin, <laughs> I, <laughs> we just keep upgrading as we're going here. Kevin, uh, mm -hmm. we're getting short on time, but I want to throw it out there to you. What are you doing um, in so your school division to uh, make everybody who's in that school division, the Catholic school division, understand more about Indigenous culture, identity, history? So we started off on, um, on uh, three projects, and I'm still working on them for this school year. Uh, but last year, we started with a program called Walking the Path. Uh, that program was created by uh, the OPP, Ontario Provincial Police, and it's an 11-module um, uh, program uh, that specifically uh, offers teachings on, t on, on important topics such as uh, the history of uh, residential school uh, and other modules on reconciliation, uh, the seven grandfather teachings, the medicine wheel. And uh, the other uh, important module is um, making the mask where students are paired up and uh, they have to trust each other when uh, they, they're making, uh, putting the plaster over their face. And uh, it, it was a great event, um, that module that we had. We even had uh, the uh, um, city police uh, officers come in the classroom and engage with the students in making that. And then the next module was um, working, uh, painting their mask, uh, reflecting on their identity. And um, so the 11th module is a graduation, uh, kind of like a feast. And uh, we had close to 300 students uh, take the program in eight schools uh, last, last year uh, in 12 classes. And, that, and um, so um, the, the, it was grade six level that, um, that uh, we targeted. And, um, and I'm currently in uh, two schools uh, this fall. And uh, I'll be uh, doing uh, three or four more schools into the new year. But nice. um, the feedback that I get from um, the, uh, the, the, the teachers and the, and the students and also uh, other staff from the board um, are really, uh, I think that this is a good program. Um, it gets uh, a weekly 75-minute uh, engagement, uh, learning about the, uh, the, from the program. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then also, too, it's nice to see that the non-Indigenous students uh, are getting really interested and engaged, mm -hmm. too, in learning about uh, uh, the culture. I just finished this week on a module of the history of the residential school, where I, um, I brought in an elder uh, to share her story of uh, two residential schools that, that she attended, uh, Lucy Kakagamak. Uh, she attended um, Pelican Falls Residential School and Poplar Hill Residential School. And, um, but um, these are kind of the projects that I had, and also I work collaboratively with two other school boards here in the, in the community, uh, Public School Board and uh, Matawa Education. Mm -hmm. We had a three-day uh, uh, Indigenous leadership gathering uh, last June, and we're planning to have another one for the school year. And we uh, localized the uh, elders and knowledge keepers too within our region. And uh, um, it's, we're mainly fo focusing on uh, empowering them and learning more about their identity and also uh, encouraging them and having open discussion of, uh, you know, what kind of purpose and, and fulfillment do they want out of life. Right. Wow. Oh, I love this. I'm so thankful. We're, we're running out of time, the voices in my head are saying. Um, 
I thank you guys. So I could sit and talk with you all day. <laughs> I just feel there's so much to learn. And I, I think that there would be a benefit to if more people like you guys were in classrooms talking to people, you know, talking to kids. If there was there more often. Um, and I don't know, maybe we're angling towards that at some point. OK, well, that is all the time that we have for this afternoon to discuss what we're teaching our children, what we should be teaching them. I thank all of my guests so much for coming and sharing their knowledge in this discussion. And I thank you guys for tuning in at home. This episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website, aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. And if you missed any of the shows and you want to catch up, you can check on our website, aptnnews.ca. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon.